He's a magna cum laude graduate of Texas Southern University, earned his J.D. at Thurgood Marshall School of Law in 1982. 2005, he was voted top lawyer for the people. Lois and Richard Moncrief instilled in their son early on that drive to never let himself down, to never give up on his dreams. He never has. A professional of uncommon talent, ability, a great friend and respected colleague, Tyrone Moncrief. How many of you have ever been to East Texas? Can I see your hands, please? Well, you, you know him, right, Mr. Smith? He, he's fabulously rich. Mr. Smith is so rich, folks, he has helicopters. He has banks. He has oil companies. He owns them all, folks. He has an Olympic-sized swimming pool in this big mansion of his. He has one daughter who's graduating from college. And he was going to give this huge party for that one daughter on a Saturday night. But you know what he did? On Friday, he went and got alligators, water moccasins, and crocodiles and put into that pool. And if you look over there, you could see them slashing and swimming through uh, that pool. He invited 150 eligible bachelors to that party Saturday night, and he said, gentlemen, he took them all to one side of that pool. Gentlemen, I will give one of three prizes to the first man who swims from one side to the other. Prize number one. 5,000 acres of property, yours clear and free tonight. Prize number two. Ten million dollars cash, we'll wire it to your account and it'll be tax free. I have those type of lawyers. Prize number three. My daughter's hand in marriage. Because if you marry my daughter, you will inherit half of whatever I own. Before he could finish the sentence, the splash. And on the other side of the pool, a young man came out dripping wet. But what was amazing, the distance he swam no human being in Olympic history has been able to swim that fast. Amazing. Everybody looks spellbound like you are right now. They all ran to the other side of the pool and the father said, son, it's amazing. What, what price do you want? 5,000 acres? Uh, no, sir, I, I don't want that 5,000 acres. Well, that, that $10 million cash? Uh, no, sir, I, I don't want that $10 million cash. Well, this kid is pretty smart. You want my daughter's hand in marriage? Well, no, sir, I don't want your daughter's hand in marriage. I like you, wondering... What do you want? I, I want the name of that dude that pushed me in that pool. <laughs> Motivation. I was never the smartest lawyer, but I was highly motivated. And when I started practicing, I began to see that there were some lawyers who created magic. And some lawyers who were just good. But some lawyers were magicians. And there was something about the lawyers who created magic. They were not just communicating. They were connecting. The good lawyers communicate. The great lawyers connect. You guys do me. You ever heard of a term called entrainment? Anybody ever heard a term called entrainment? And you've seen it, don't know the term. 
You ever seen a group of birds flying all together, flock as though they're thinking the same thought? Group of fish swimming together, and a predator comes and they turn on the same thought. It's called entrainment, where you have a body of people thinking one thought. Do me a favor, guys. I want you to do something for me. I want you to think of the three greatest speakers you've ever heard in your lives. Three. And I want you to take one of them and listen to the voice of that speaker, listen to the rhythm of his words, and put the image of that speaker and the speech itself in your mind. All right? Now, there was a survey taken. Hundreds and hundreds of people were told that. And let me tell you then, those four that you see, 95% of the people who were asked that question mentioned one of those four names. 95% of the people. And you know what? They could take an audience and it was like entrainment. They could reduce an audience to one thought. You still hear their words even until this day. What made them so great? They created images in your mind. To this day, you can hear their voices now. They created images in your mind, similar to the next event, images in your mind. Depending on what era you're in, depending on where you're from, there is an image there, this microsecond image that brings you back to a place in time. You remember where you were? You remember who you were with? That image can take you back to a place in time. I began to see that the great lawyers and the great communicators were doing just that. They could create an image in your mind that would last forever. You notice something else about those speakers I brought up to you, the first four? How many of them, as you raise your hand, use PowerPoint in their presentations? They didn't. See, and I'm not against high technology, folks, but technology sometimes interrupt powerful communication. Am I right, Mr. Ackerman? You're right. You know I'm right about that. Technology can interrupt the power full communication of you and an audience. So what I wanted to do with doing this presentation was sort of look at what those storytellers were doing and see how we can apply some of those great techniques of those storytellers who created images and put it in courtroom. Let me tell you who's, who are the greatest storytellers. You know where they work now? They work with advertisements. They take those people who can create stories, advertisers, hire them. Let me show you how powerful the images they create, folks. Let me show you an example. You know, I'm a lawyer. I don't say nothing, but I can't prove it. That was a cigarette commercial. Somebody help me with this. A long time ago. That started off something like this. I want somebody to finish it for me. I will walk a mile for a... Winston, tastes good. All right, that group right there, that you can tell how old they are, right? Sitting right in the middle. You know why? You haven't heard that commercial in 42 years. I didn't say four years. 42 years, 
The commercial has been outlawed. It's not even played anymore. But the creators or the advertisers, those storytellers, can implant it into your subconscious where you never forget about it. This is the one that gets me. This is the one that gets me. How do you spell relief? I spell it just like you do. R-O-L-E-I-D-S. Image makers. It was Ted Sarson who said in 1960, the election between Nixon and Kennedy was the first time in American history where images became more important than words. Images. So when we're trying our cases, wouldn't it make sense for us, us to start utilizing images in our presentations? Guys, give me a point. Name me some of the great storytellers, writers, just names that come out. Who are they? John Steinbeck was such a great writer that they said he could take darkness and make you feel it. Mark Twain, another one. Antoine Chekhov was considered such a great writer, they called him a photographer with words. They could take words and make you feel. They can make you feel something with words. And when you're looking at that juror, when you're making your final argument, don't you have to ask the question, how do I want these people to feel when they go into the back and make that decision? Who are some of the great storytellers, directors? Give me some names. Oh, so who said Hitchcock? Oh, you've been listening to me already. He knows it. Hitchcock was probably the master, Alfred Hitchcock. And Alfred Hitchcock was so great, folks, all the other directors start utilizing Hitchcock. Demi, Spielberg, I learned because of Hitchcock. How many of you have ever seen a movie called The Birds? How many have not seen The Birds? It was a story about a place in California where these birds were killers and when they're coming, attacking people. I'm going to show you a scene from Hitchcock of the birds. And we're going to watch what method Hitchcock used in the birds to tell a story. Can you hit that for me, sir?
the master effect of Hitchcock was he pulled you into that scene whether you wanted to be there or not. There were two stories told in that clip. If you analyze it now as a lawyer, what the woman was going through, but you notice the woman never saw the birds building up. And then I realized what Hitchcock was doing. The audience saw the birds building up. The tension developed not because of what the woman saw, because of what the audience saw. You couldn't just watch a scene with Hitchcock. He put you in the scene. And I thought about it. Well, shouldn't we do that as criminal defense lawyers? Take the audience and put them in the scene. Mr. Demi, the director who directed Silence of the Lamb. Can I see those who know, have seen Silence of the Lamb? Just about all of us have. Use some of Hitchcock's techniques. He puts you in the scene. And when Agent Starling first met Hannibal Lecter, the serial killer, he decided he'd let you see exactly what she saw from her perspective as though you were walking down the hallway to see Hannibal Lecter. Hit that next clip for me, sir. Watch Agent Stalley. <laughs> I'm better when I stand up.
Both of those actors receive Academy Awards because they riveted the room. They took you there. And you couldn't take your eyes off them. They riveted anybody who watched the scene because you walked through her steps. And I thought about, shouldn't we do that in trial? Take Hitchcock, Demi's techniques, and use that with our jurors. Before I got to that thing, though, folks, I started, I remembered something that happened to me when I was in undergrad school. Never forgot it. I don't remember a lot about undergrad school, but I remember this. You won't forget it either. My teacher walked in, English literature, and she did what I'm about to do to you. She said, I want you to go to your refrigerators at home. How many of you have white, green, gray, silver refrigerators, black? I get everybody's refrigerator. Go to yours. And go to the room that you see that refrigerator in. And walk up to that refrigerator and take one hand and slowly pull it open. Notice the white light that comes on. The cool breeze hits you right about here. You see a lemon, it is the biggest lemon you've ever seen. That's the only thing in there. That lemon, what's your name, ma'am? Suzanne, Suzanne, you see that lemon? I know you saw it. I want you to take that lemon, Suzanne, and I want you to take it out and put it on the nearest table and start to roll it. It's kind of heavy, your hand sort of drops because it's so heavy. You put it on the nearest table and start to roll it Backwards, forward, backwards, forward, backwards, forward. Reach into for that knife, the one in your utensils right nearest you, the sharpest one. Notice the noise of those knives when you're reaching for them. Take that knife and put it right on the middle of that lemon and start to slowly cut it backwards, forward, backwards, forward. Juices are starting to come out. You turn your head because of the smell. Backwards, forward, backwards, forward until it splits in two. And I want you to take the side that has the seeds in it, squeeze it a little bit so some of the juices now run over your head. I want you to take that side of the lemon Put it in your mouth and bite it. Boy, if you see some of the frowning faces I see up here. Some of you taste bitterness. Some of you actually taste that lemon. Can I see the hands of you who actually taste the lemon? Now, not being a lawyer, What does it do to you physically? Anybody tell me. How many had some discomfort in here in their mouth? How many had some uncomfortable feeling in their jaw? How many people started tasting the lemon before you bit it? I learned one important thing with that demonstration. When my teacher did that, I said to myself, wow. Wow. That's dangerous. You know why this was dangerous? Because it wasn't a real lemon. But my body physically reacted as though it was. My body tasted a real lemon. my body started having physical reactions as though it was a real lemon. I learned something. Albert Einstein said the human mind is the most powerful entity in the world. And it does not know the difference between what's real and what's imagined vividly. Real and what's imagined vividly. 
Notice though, when I told that story, I used every sense that you have, otherwise you wouldn't have tasted it. And I thought about that, well, why don't we use that in trial? Images, Hitchcock, Silence of the Lamb, the images of the simple lemon. And I began to learn something, folks. People walk into courtrooms with images of their own mind. See, you couldn't have tasted that lemon if you never tasted one before. But anything you've tasted before, the human imagination could bring it back to you. People have a lot of vision already of what they're going to think about when they walk into that courtroom. And I thought about Void Air. Jury walks in, and let me use Grant as an example, right here. Grant is my client, we're in trial. Grant is fabulously rich, highly charismatic, everybody loves him. As soon as you walk in, he just breaks the room up. He said that's true too, folks, we'll let you know. Uh, but that's his personality. We're in trial. What you haven't heard yet is the words the indictment hasn't been read. For Grant is charged with aggravated sexual assault of a six-year-old. I'm going to repeat that because some of those judges repeat them on me for some reason. Re re they repeat it twice. Aggravated sexual assault of a six-year-old. Now you notice something. If you're careful, there's a mood shift in the room. How many of you notice a mood shift? Can I see it to your hands? Something is different now in the room. And I don't want you to be lawyers, I know you are, but act like you're not. There is a word that is in your gut right now. When I said he's charged with aggravated sexual assault, of a six-year-old, what is that word that's in your gut? If you're thinking about it, it's, it's, it's not the right word. The word that's in your gut is what? Disgust, what's another one? Pervert always comes up, what's another one? Pedophile, what's another one? What is? Animal, animal. Well, I can only take so many of those now, I'm a criminal defense lawyer. We're gonna stop that. Let's just stop it there. I, I had one group to say, devil, and I knew it was time for me to stop. Those are the words in the audience, gut. And I don't care how much you try to diffuse that, it's in their gut. It's here. What do you do? The great lawyers can use simple stories, folks. Folks, you know what? I don't get to take my daughter, pick my daughter up from school much because I'm an attorney, my wife usually does. One day I have to pick her up and take her to the dentist. And when I went to get her, they wouldn't let me pick her up. Well, I gave them all types of identification, that's my daughter, no. And it wasn't until my daughter came down the hallway and said, yeah, that's my dad that they let me take her. I didn't get mad at those folks. We are a society to protect our women and our children, and I knew they were protecting my daughter. And I didn't get mad at you. When the judge read the indictment, and all the women on the front row pulled back, the men frowned, I didn't get mad with you. We are a society to protect our women and our children. And there's nothing worse in this type of case except one thing. And that's an innocent person being charged with this type of case. And what you gotta do is sit back and let the audience absorb that. You can't go too fast. Because once you let the audience absorb that, you'll see another subtle shift in the room. 
a subtle shift in the room. You know, and I love doing these seminars because it's, it's not like real life, first of all. I could do anything I want to do up here. You know, for example, I could be doing opening statement up here, but I'm going to act like I'm a prosecutor because my defense lawyer's opening statement is kind of tough. I'm going to act as though I'm a prosecutor and let you use your creativity to put it to yours. But we're going to use all the things we've learned in this opening statement. But as though I'm a prosecutor, this is how I would do one if I was a prosecutor. Judge said, Mr. Moncrief, you can present. Yes, ma'am. If you had been at Maine and Travis on August the 15th, 2010, right across the street, you see the Mulberry Apartments. There's a door open, 116. There's a lady walking toward 116. She's going to see her sister. They were supposed to have lunch two hours ago and her sister is never late. She opens the door and when she opens the door, the room is spotlessly clean, as usual. But there was no noise. And her niece and nephew are usually making noise. She walked right through the back and she walked to the kitchen area. And when she got to the kitchen area, on the wall there was a red arc of blood. And on the floor was her sister. And her head was sliced open like a watermelon. And she screamed. And she screamed. And she screamed. And she didn't stop screaming until she heard the noise in the hallway. And then she remembered her niece and nephew. She ran to the hallway, quickly opened the door, and her niece was bending down with her hand over her little brother's mouth. And she said, that man is going to get us. That man is going to get us. Three weeks later, Detective Jones had five men in a room. They'd walk to the middle of the floor, say a few words, and walk back. Walk to the middle of the floor, say a few words, and walk back. With well, a man in the third squad, walk to the middle of the floor, said a few words and walked back. The little girl said, that man is going to get us. That man is going to get us. And ladies and gentlemen, that man is in this room. He's sitting right over here. And I'd sit down. And I'd sit down. Some of you know right now that case may have or, or very well be over with. Anybody tell me why? Why is it that juror right now has formed an opinion? Anybody tell me? Who said that? All right, what's your name, sir? Huh? Don. Don said they're afraid of him. I'm always aware of how the motion in the room shifts. And I know fear is in the room. And I know, Don, that there are jurors who want to do something to this guy. They don't, they're not gonna let him go. They don't want him to leave. Why not? Because it's not the little girl that they're protecting. They're afraid for themselves. And like Hitchcock, what you do is put them, the words put them in a scene where they're afraid of the gentleman who's sitting in the room. 
Stories. Power of stories. How many of you have ever been to a VA hospital? Can I see your hands? We're going to go to one 1984 in August the 14th, and we're going to go to the ninth floor. Catch that elevator, go right on up. Down the hallway there, we're going to go to the room 913. And as we walk down the hallway, a lady walks toward us. She's dressed in white with some tablets in front of her. And we we pass by her. We go to 913 and it's not a door there, folks. It's a sheet. We push that sheet open. And on the bed in front of us, an old man is lying with his, on his stomach having difficulty breathing as though he has asthma. Seems real old, frail, difficulty breathing. It's a heave with his chest. You know what? My dad, If I were to ask you a question right now, who took you to school on the very first day? I bet you say your mom. Or not me. My dad took me the first day. When I tried to play baseball, I wasn't very good at it. You know, I tried to turn a single into a double. Everybody telling me to stop at first. I'm gonna run down all the way to second. When I slid in the second, that. Some rounds of the base caught and I cut my knee open real bad. Blood coming everywhere. My dad, I didn't know he was at the game. My dad got onto that field before anybody could and he lifted me up like this. He didn't say a word. And he took me off. My dad. And on, for some reason, I had asthma when I was young. Saturday nights, for some reason, it was worse. And I'm laying in my bed, having difficulty breathing at night. My dad. Walk in with that Vicks vapor rub and spread it on my chest. And I breathe better. My dad. I wish I had some Vicks vapor rub tonight. I like to walk, put it on his chest. Maybe he'd breathe better. That's my dad, right there. Yeah, that's my dad. I'm a grown man, I've never told my dad I loved him. You know that macho thing? Guys don't do it, but I'm gonna tell him tonight. Before I get up to my father though, the lady walked up to me and said, Mr. Muncriff, come back, your father needs his rest. And I promised I'd be there very early the next morning. But as I was taking a shower that morning, the telephone began to ring. And it rung. And it rung. I want you to listen to the audience right now. You haven't heard an audience this quiet? Because it's not quiet that you hear, it's introspection. You've left the room, sort of disappeared, and gone somewhere else. Let's come back to it. We could do that as trial lawyers. We can make the audience leave the room. Okay, I talked about opening statements, void our final arguments. How do we use some of these stories and anecdotes and final arguments? How many of you knew Abraham Lincoln was a criminal defense lawyer? All you guys knew that, right? But how many of you knew he also tried civil cases? He was a railroad lawyer. Lincoln was trying a case against these lawyers from the Northeast. 
And there are four of them. They're the best lawyers in the, in the country. They came down and they were disputing Lincoln on this big trial. And they came down, brilliant lawyers. And when it came time to final arguments, two of them got up and they gave brilliant summations. Absolutely brilliant. And then it was time for Lincoln to get up. And Lincoln got up. He said, gentlemen, because you know during that time it was only males on the jury. Gentlemen, the lawyers from the East, the lawyers from the East have given great, brilliant statements. They've got the facts right. But they reached the wrong conclusion. And when he said that, the gentlemen all burst out laughing. So much that they were pounding the table and the judge said, settle down, settle down. They escorted them out. And five minutes later, they came right back out. And the verdict was in favor of Lincoln. Nobody could understand it. And so the, one of the young lawyers for the group from Northeast, he said, he walked up to Mr. Lincoln, he said, Mr. Mr. Lincoln, what happened in there? We're well, doing that time, folks. The lawyers could have lunch with the jury. Lincoln was a master storyteller. You know that, folks. Lincoln told a story to the jury while he was having lunch with him. He said, you know, it reminds me of a story where a gentleman had this old farmer was out back at his pastor and he was cleaning up and trying to get things in order and his son was running toward him. His son was running toward him and he said, Dad, Dad, Sister girl is in the barn and she's raising her dress up in a new form hand. He's in there with her and he's pulling his pants down. Dad, I think they're going to pee on all the hay up there. The father looked at him and said, son, you got your facts right but you reached the wrong conclusion. <laughs> arguments, how do you use some of your arguments? How do you use a simple story? One of the greatest lawyers I've ever seen and I've watched a lot in this organization was Doug Tinker. Can I see the hands of those who know Doug Tinker? If you don't know him folks, you miss something. Doug died just a couple of years ago. Doug Tinker was one of the most phenomenal storytellers I've ever seen. Doug had a case where his client is in the bar and is, gets into an argument and Doug's client pulls the pistol out and shoots the guy in the chest. The guy turns, runs out the bar, Doug's client shoots him in the back. He gets to the front door, he falls on his face. Doug's client runs behind him, empties the pistol in his back, reloads and empties the pistol in his back back. Doug's defense? Self-defense. Yeah, I laughed too when I heard it. I said, Doug, how do you get the self-defense on that? And Doug Tinker, being a master story teller that he was, he said, ladies and gentlemen, you know, when I was a little boy, me and my brother used to get in the backyard and we throw rocks at each other. And one day we were throwing rocks at each other and this big snake came up to the gate. We couldn't get out, blocked us out. Neighbor across the street ran and got my mother. And my mother came with a shovel. She was afraid of snakes. But she came with that shovel. And she started to hit that snake. And she started to hit that snake. And when that snake started to pull back, she kept hitting that snake. And then when that snake was dead, she continued to hit that snake. We had to stop her from hitting that snake. Ladies and gentlemen, the gentleman who was killed, Mr. Smith, was a snake. And you know, I couldn't deal with it intellectually, but Mr. Ackerman, I felt it. They're not guilty on that. See, that's how Vivian King gets all these not guilty. They, 
They create images where the jury, even if it doesn't make sense logically, they want to lean toward you. One of the very first arguments, what's my time like, Grant? All right, good. One of the very first best arguments I heard was, not a criminal lawyer, I'm always telling everybody criminal defense lawyers are the best, from a civil lawyer. And there was a young man who's representing a guy who had had both arms cut off here at the elbow. And when they went to lunch, the jurors let them go to lunch and they came back to do arguments. The young man got up to the audience and said, ladies and gentlemen, when you went to lunch, I noticed how you were using your utensils and you're all having a good time. When me and Billy went to lunch, he doesn't eat like you. Billy eats like a dog. Billy eats like a dog. And he sat down. And he cleaned up with that jury, folks. Because the audience saw the image of a 23-year-old man for the rest of his life who will eat like a dog. I don't, when I give presentations, I never talk about my cases, you know. And when I do talk about the ones I've, I had, I talk about the ones I've lost, not the ones I've won. Because it's the ones that I've lost that I've learned the most. It's those that I've lost that I've learned the most. Just this past Tuesday, I was supposed to speak yesterday, you guys noticed, but I was in trial. We finished Tuesday at three o'clock. And a jury walked in just like, they're, like they were coming in from here. And I knew that first juror, Amy, I knew that first juror was with us. How many of you ever tried a death penalty case? But I also knew when I felt death come into a room, Mr. Ackerman, you know what I mean? When death walks into a room, ladies and gentlemen, you can feel it. I work with four lawyers, Robert Morrow, Amy Martin, Pat McCann, and Asha. And we had the difficult client, folks. How many of you have a difficult client? <laughs> how many of you, see, how many of you win all your cases with good clients? We had a difficult client. We say A, he says B. We say no, you shouldn't testify. He said no, I should. You know one of those clients where you can't even ask questions to? You got to do it in a narrative form? You guys know what I'm talking about. Just say what you want to say. That type of client. And after a while, Mr. Ackerman, after a while, we couldn't fight for him anymore. He wouldn't fight for us. We were dog tired. So we had to fight for each other. We had to fight for each other. I fought for Amy Martin, Pat McCann, Robert Morrow, and Asher. Stand up, Amy. Asher, stand up, stand up. These two ladies, and I, they don't want to stand up. They told me don't mention them. Okay, can y'all give them a hand for me, folks? <laughs> they told me don't mention my name, Tyrone. Don't do it. But you know what? I'm 50 years old. I do what I want to do. <laughs> I mentioned them because we became blood brothers and sisters. We could not fight for our clan, but we had to fight for each other. We had to fight for each other. I will never forget them. I will never forget them because in the face of death, we had to stand up and face it. And some of you, some of you have those type of clients in the face of death, 
you had to stand and face it. Emmett Harris is here. I don't know where he is. Emmett, you're in the back somewhere. A um, good friend of mine, Emmett Harris, told me a story once. Emmett and, I, Emmett and I are totally different, folks. I'm a black guy from the urban area. Emmett is a white guy from the rural area. But when I met Emmett, it was as though I had met my long-lost brother. And he reminded me of the movie The Killer Bockenberg. And he reminded me of the scene when you know when you fought your best, you've given everything you have, and you lost anyway. Emmett reminded me of that. And I want to play that scene in Killer Mockenberg. Could you hit it for me, sir? Killer Mockenberg. Thank you. This is right after the verdict. If you guys read the book, you know that 
they stood up in the book when they said, stand up. A lawyer is walking out. Stand up. A lawyer is walking by. When it's difficult and you can't stand for yourself and it's it's over with and you fought and given everything you have and there's nothing left and you've lost. Remember there are lawyers who are standing up for you. Even if you're in there by yourself. The lawyers in this room are a bond. Those are my brothers over there. Remember the lawyers who came before you, Warren Barnett and all the great ones. Imagine as though they're standing up for you. Imagine they're standing up for you. Imagine people who can't articulate it themselves inarticulate they're poor they're standing up for you imagine imagine that every lawyer in this room is standing up for you because there there walks a lawyer thank you very much